Welcome to the Earth Feels Podcast. I'm Rose. And I'm Christine. Welcome to Earth Feels, the podcast for people feeling overwhelmed by the endlessly gloomy climate news. Where every week we have soul-based conversations about climate change and explore the idea that climate change may be happening for us as much as it is happening to us. If you are ready to shift your focus and secure the future for our kids and our grandkids, then this is the podcast for you. And yes, we do know how to spell. (laughs) Good morning. Today's question is, how do we talk to our kids about climate change? And we just happen to have the expert here on that, um, Harriet Sugarman. She is the founder of Climate Mama. Um, back way back in 2009. Um, her mission is to help kids, help parents learn more about climate so they can talk to their kids help and help their kids understand. She's the mother of now two young adults and the author of How to Talk to Your Kids About Climate Change. Just came out, just was released last Sunday. So we're very excited to have her here. Welcome, Harriet. And Thank I, you. I love the subtitle, Moving from Angst to Action. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And so um, it is so exciting to have you here, Harriet. I've, I've met you in person. We've been Facebook friends for a decade. And I've also seen you on the television during the climate reality shows. They aren't marathons exactly, but the 24 hours of climate <laughs> reality. So you've been up on the stage with Vice President Gore. And so to start off, do you want to share a bit about why you're doing this work, why you've been doing it for over a decade, and what's your motivation? Yeah, thanks, Christine. Yes, and I have been doing this work full-time with both feet in since my training with the Climate Reality Project, and I know that um, we've, all, all three of us have had that experience, and it's a really powerful one. And uh, well, in, in a previous life, I actually worked on climate at at the United Nations for the International Monetary Fund, I worked on this very big stage and I was involved in the uh, preparatory meetings for the first Earth Summit way, way back in 1992. And um, it always felt very removed from me personally, the climate crisis. Yeah, even then when we recognized it was an emergency and we needed to address it, it still felt like it was not happening to me or not in my world. And I think doing the climate reality training, which I did way back in 2007, my first training, and then I have stayed involved with the organization ever since. And I met the most wonderful, caring, um, kind, thoughtful, and smart people there, including the two that I'm in this room with right now. Uh But it brought it home to me that it was happening. And I think you've talked about this on previous shows, not only to me, because it's what we feel personally, but to me, and all of us collectively in a way that was actually happening in our time to our world. And at the time I did the training, my children were in grade school and I hadn't thought about what their future would be like. And all of a sudden that future wasn't clear to me. And it also made me realize that for many kids then and there, it wasn't just their future, it was their now. Like we were living a climate emergency. And I actually really saw it and felt it. So it became, well, what can I do? What am I going to do? And um, I think you and I have talked about this before. All of a sudden, I was looking for places to meet other parents. Um, You know, my background is is as an economist. It wasn't in that. It was through my heart. It It wasn't my head and my work speaking. All of a sudden, it was, how do I talk to my kids? How do I learn more from that perspective to be able to share with them. And, and so that's when a cu- two years after the training, I, I'd spent those couple of years figuring out and I thought there's, there's no space really currently online where I can jump in and talk to other parents specifically about this. I could talk about other environmental issues, um, health issues, but what, the way the climate crisis brings it all together so that's when I started Climate Mama and how I felt motivated to, to move forward with Climate Mama. That's wonderful. It's been quite a journey for you. And some people who are 
as committed as you have been for all this time get discouraged and yet here you are you are not ramping down at all you are it's uh, 2020 and you've just come out with this book so why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about what this book is about and what prompted you to write it at this time Yes, you know, so I guess it's something I've been writing in my head, right, for a long time, parts of it. And um, we have a blog on the Climate Mama website, and I've written a lot of blog posts. I've written for other um, media outlets locally and uh, nationally. But I've been thinking about how do I put this all in a different kind of package. And watching and um, listening the last few years as our children's voices, uh, are being heard. Not that they weren't there before because they have been there for a long time. But I think we've you know, been at now a generation of kids that are growing up learning about the climate crisis online. You know, those kids that are maybe now just graduating high school or really knowing and learning about it in school or hearing about it. And they are, some of them are really angry. Some of them are taking action. Some of them are being activists, they're doing it in different ways. And I think that we are listening in a different way. And so I saw this and I thought, well, and I was hearing from um, parents that were reaching out through Climate Mama and other ways like, well, I don't have the words. I don't, I'm not sure how to share with my kids or respond to them uh, or, or are they too young to hear it or I want them to hear it from me. And I thought it's really, it's the right time now to take this and package it in this format that actually takes our climate mama motto, which is tell the truth, actions speak louder than words, and don't be afraid, and, and help parents come to grips with the truth, really the reality in a way that they can understand it with what it means to take action and show our kids and deal with the sadness and the grief and the fear uh, that our kids are feeling and help them move through it. So it really, um, it felt like the right time. And I would think when I reached out to different publishers, I was hearing back that it was the right time. And yeah, it, came, it happened. It seemed like it took a really long time, but it just took the last year. It really came together quickly. And so I'm really happy to be talking to you about it. I am really pleased with how it turned out. It wasn't necessarily what I originally thought, but with the help of the publisher and making it what it is, I think it's very accessible. And I also got to have the wisdom and words of other parents that are working on the climate crisis and they let me share those. So it's, it's not just me. So I was just really struck by your book, Harriet, because so much of it, I mean, it's so rich in facts. Every, I, I'm reading it and then I'm having to Google like so many things and, you know, in a good way, just, just really giving me um, more depth. And, and I'm not like you and Christine, I did my training back in 2015, but I really didn't do anything with it until we started this podcast. And so it's been a deep dive, a really quick deep dive for me. And there was, there was so much information in your book. And yet at the same time, it's so accessible because of those stories that you're, that you were telling that, that you really get to see every parent struggle, every parent struggle with the future of what their kids future looks like. So I, so I sent a text to my kids last night and asked them when they first remember hearing about climate change. And in, in those whirlwind years, um, their first, my youngest, who is now 25, he, he said his first memory of it is us as a family sitting down and watching Al Gore's movie mm -hmm. together, which was really, I think, 2006. Is that correct? It was, yes. Yeah, so that's, it seems like it should have been before then. Do you remember when your kids were first, or they first approached you or how they first found out about it? Yeah, for, for me, I, I think also that that film was a conscious raising um, that made it outside of certain bubbles. I think, you know, there, there was discussion about it, but I think that the crisis, which we knew was building, right, as you said it earlier, uh, we've known for, you know, for decades, but really it wasn't until I think, you know, in that first time in 1989, when there were congressional hearings in the U.S. about it, this is a very, you know, I'm being U.S. centric here, but that all of a sudden it was on the front page of the New York Times. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, then in the following years and periods, there were moments, but I think that that film did wake up um, people 
to recognize we pass certain thresholds. And so that was a time I, I think, you know, I just read today that uh, in Mauna Loa, you know, because we feel like we're living, we are living in this crazy time with COVID-19, but that the CO2 emissions, right? We know that if we stop tomorrow, they're still rising because right. what we put in the atmosphere stays there forever. So it's, um, you know, they're at uh, 418 parts per million. And, wow. you know, th that is crazy that, and, th and that that continues. So I've gotten off topic from when did my kids know about the climate crisis? I'll bring it back there. Uh, but I think that my kids, it was part of their lives uh, because when I did the training, I started practicing in front of them and my dog. <laughs> And I would, you know, they were little, and then I would take them to rallies with me, and I would take them places with me, and the, so it's just been part of their lives. And they were really happy to be with mom when they were, you know, nine, ten, eleven, and then all of a sudden when they turned fourteen and fifteen, I think I became more embarrassing to them. And there were mm -hmm. not a lot of our family friends were out there talking about the climate crisis like I do and have been. But I see them now as young adults finding their way back in and it's part of their life. So I know I got off tangent there. No, Sorry. but I, I, I really think about it as a gift that you've given your kids. And frankly, I've given my kids too and, and Rose as well, that whether or not they appreciate it. And I know when I started my blog back in October, 2009, so I hadn't told anybody, I just went out and got blogging for dummies from the library. and. <laughs> and worked on it because I knew they'd be like, what? You can't do that. And, um, and they were horrified. The girls were like, just don't talk about us. I've got two girls. I know you have a, a daughter and a son, but like, don't mention our names. I had to commit to that. So, it, so again, yeah, kind of embarrassing. And, and talking about climate change, especially back in 2009. Yeah, not like, like, it it shuts down a room i've i've uh, talked about it. it's like farting in public it's less so now but people look away yeah, I told you. Pre pretend they didn't <laughs> pretend they didn't hear you know it, it was like like it's embarrassing to to it was less so now and also you mentioned the co2 levels and i went back because I, I also looked at what the co2 level is today and i look back at the level in october of 2009 when you started Climate Mama and I started blogging and it was 384. So still above 350 parts per million, but right. yeah. So 418 and despite the fact that pretty much the world has shut down for the last couple months, right? Um, we're, we're seeing so many, so many less cars on the road because people are, people are in their homes. So we are experiencing that, that, that effect of all the CO2 that's up there is still we're still rising before we can draw down so we're seeing what what it will take before the drawdown happens well i think that your you know that word and that reminder about drawdown is what we actually need to be working on that and come up with different ways to actually draw it down moving forward so I, my understanding from what I've read in the scientific literature is that if we are to meet those targets by 2030 and 2050 that the Paris Climate Agreement tell us, et cetera, we actually need to um, reduce our carbon emissions by seven to eight percent a year. And we're on track to do that this year. So we can't do this kind of hold every year. So drawdown has to be part of it. And we're seeing pollution dissipate. It's different than greenhouse gas emissions, which um, you know, people, we're still using energy, even though, but it's in our homes in a different way. So the direct emissions that create that pollution, those particles, are, the air is clearing up. So that's a positive, right? It's making people talk about the climate crisis, that, or at least the environmental crisis that we face and what, what the earth can do if we give her an opportunity to heal. But the climate crisis uh, is something that is continuing will continue we can't fix it fast they're uh, in the they're in the the emissions are in the air and they're gonna there we've already put them out there is what yeah. you're saying what exactly. the science says yeah exactly so we can slow down the climate crisis right that's the whole what we're trying to talk to our kids about to give them hope to build our own hope about it 
and there are so many things that we can do uh, and it's but it's already such a huge problem that there's no linear steps by you know if we stop tailpipe emissions today it would solve the climate crisis that's not going to happen but it might save hundreds of thousands of lives because mm -hmm. the air pollution is left because we know air pollution kills seven million people a year that's crazy mm -hmm. um but so that so the two go together but they're they don't work in the same way in terms of solving the problems at hand mm -hmm. well so it's kind of a flattening of the curve like we're talking with covid exactly it's similar yeah. we need to be flattening the curve so that we can extend the life of humanity it's a perfect way to put it mm -hmm. yeah so you talk a bit about and correct me if i'm not saying it right uh solastasia how would you pronounce that word yeah, solastasia mm -hmm. okay and do you want to talk a bit about that yeah so i do um what i do in the book are, are is share things that i think that we as parents need to understand so that we can then speak to our kids so part of that understanding is understanding the science uh understanding the environment, the political environment we're operating, operating in, the, the way climate affects us um, from a justice perspective, and the solastasia or, the, or the, the grief, the part that comes with it, the sadness of knowing all of those things mm -hmm. of what we're facing. And so th that is a way of describing the sadness we feel, or it's a, a word that's been coined to to um, talk about the sadness we feel when we're still at home. So us being at home on our planet, understanding what's happening because this climate grief that many of us, especially you know, those of us that are working in the movement and on it, but more and more so um, people that are just coming to understand the, the actual depth of the urgency of the crisis, it, is, it brings terrible mental anguish um to it so uh part there are different ways of coming to terms or understanding with that that psychiatrists and psychologists are just coming to try to address and they have to learn too right it's a it's a different kind of sadness um, or a mental angst or anguish that also needs to be understood and so that is one of the ways that uh, and a term it's an australian psychologist that has coined that term solastasia Mm -hmm. Dr. Lisa Van Susteren, who I'm sure you're familiar with, talks about yes. pre pre traumatic stress syndrome instead of post, and that's that's what uh, yes the term she she applies to very much the same thing. What what we're going through when we see our planet, our existence, our children and grandchildren's ex existence threatened, and not only that, but when you look out the window and you see nature. I mean, I'm looking out, I see the boreal forest. I just, just got back into Northern Ontario a few days ago and the lakes and all of that wildlife. It's, it's, so it's not just our own existence, but it's nature that, that as we know it is, has been changed, so. Yeah, no, it has. And, and you mentioned uh, Lisa and she, she also has a new book coming out oh. uh, on the emotional, or that just came out actually last month. So you may want to. Um, okay. Look more closely at that, and perhaps yes. have to get the new show. <laughs> yeah, it would be great. I talked to her before I presented at the Association of Comprehensive Energy Psychology in 2016. I did a presentation on EFT tapping, which is the kind of energy work that I do, and climate grief. We had a she and I had a great conversation, so I'd love to have her on. Good idea. Yeah, she, she wrote one of the endorsements for my book. Oh. So I'd love to switch the conversation to hope. So tune in next week when Rose and I carry on our conversation with Harriet Sugarman, aka Climate Mama, where we talk about hope, individual responsibility versus uh, collective or systemic change. You won't want to miss that conversation. But now let's chat about some good news. Uh, Rose, do you want to share some good news now? And then we will ask Harriet to share an action tip or two. And also a tip about what keeps you sane that maybe you can share with our listeners. Yeah, um, so I would say the, the good news for that I see this week is that lots of high-tech companies have told their employees that they can now work for home, from home. 
Some of them are through 2020, some of them are through 2021. Twitter is actually forever. They can work from home forever. So that's Facebook and Google and Apple and Microsoft, Twitter, Salesforce. I mean, huge numbers of big companies um, are saying stay home and work. And that does feed into the CO2 emissions coming down. And what, what will be the ripple effect? I mean, you talked a lot about ripple effects in your, in your book too, Harriet. What will be the ripple effect from there? How many employees, um, how many companies will just say, you know, we don't need to have everybody come in. I'm seeing that in my own little neighborhood here um, that we're all, you know, sequestered in our little 10,000 square foot lots, whatever. Um, one, of the, one of the young men who lives down the street, both he and his wife are working from home and they're not, his company specifically is not renewing their, their commercial lease in Boston after this. They've decided that it works well. It's, it's made a lot of companies who would never have looked at it before look at it now. So I think that's great news. Absolutely. And I would also say some good news because it's gardening season and because Harriet has a uh, part of her book where she talks about planting seeds, literally and figuratively. I think that's a gift that the COVID-19 crisis has given people. I, I can't speak in the U.S. specifically because I'm Canadian, but I think Canadians have gone, whoa, we need to be more, way more self-sufficient because of mm -hmm. issues uh, uh, at the border and getting things from, you know, this whole global trade. It's great until it's not there. And so planting seeds, uh, Rose is going to talk a bit, I don't know about now, or maybe in another podcast about the huge garden. You just got, what, six yards of Soil. Yeah, I'm turning my front yard into a vegetable garden. I mean, I've, I've been I've been in process a couple of years and and realizing that that's the sunniest place. That's where the soil is actually the richest. So, so that's um, a that's a commitment. Six yards of soil, and that's not yeah. the last of it. So yeah, yeah. And, it's, and it's you're a work in progress. Yeah, and you were saying how your neighbors are starting conversations because, of course, it's not you're not in your backyard working. You're out in your your front yard. So yeah, who so, knows what. So there, there's some influence there. Let's, everybody's like really fascinated by it and thinking, oh, that's a good idea. So we'll mm -hmm. see. Yes. So uh, that's a couple of good news. I don't know if you have any uh, good news uh, items that you wanted to share, Harriet, or we, we should just go right into action tips. Well, no, I, I think that all that we've been talking about, the way people have been inspired, those things that you've just mentioned, um, I think those are all good news. I would um, say yes. Christine in the US too, many people are planting gardens um, and digging in the dirt. And I think that not only of planting seeds, but being reconnected to nature in that way, even in this time where we, so many of us are not able to get out when we can, those vibrations from nature, literally that you feel and figuratively by having your feet on the ground, touching a tree, listening, we're hearing nature in ways that it, not that those birds weren't there or singing, but whether they're more involved in to sing louder or we just didn't hear them before, I think we're listening. And so I think that's good news. We hear that and see that from people all over the world sharing nature. Um, and again, not that it wasn't there, but I think we're so busy with our lives that this forced step back and slowing down, I think that will hold well for all of us um, moving forward. Nice. And do you have an action tip? I know you have an action tip, or I know you have more than one, but what would you like <laughs> to share with our listeners today? Yes, thanks. I, well, I, I want to just go back to those planting seeds, literally and figuratively. I think we each find ways to take that action. And maybe we don't have or can't turn our front yards into gardens. Although I have to say someone who did that, Rose, if you aren't familiar with the Canadian artist, Frankie James, um, years ago, she lives, uh, used to live in Toronto. I don't know if she still did. So she took out her driveway in Toronto to build a garden and they weren't going to allow her, the city officials, to do that. And so just the same way that your neighbors are talking to you about what you're doing. She created a big uproar doing that. And yeah, she likes to say, I've quoted her, you, you know, would do the hardest thing first. And sometimes those are hard things to do, but we do them and then it generates that conversation and discussion. So I think, um, you know, plant seeds um, in the ground, 
or in other people's minds. And um, we will find our way not only through this, but in a, in a way that we will remember that we were here when things changed and started growing in a, in a, in a holistic, more positive way to, for us mm. um, to have hope in our future. That's I like crazy. that. Like that. Yeah. We, we can say we were here and we, we can't give up hope. And just on a side note, I actually saw Frankie's front yard. Yeah. It was great. Yeah. Small, but it was Toronto. And yeah. uh, um, so, so do you have a sanity tip? How, w when you have your dark moments, what, what buoys you? You know, um, well, two things, I guess, is just my, I, I refuse to, accept that my children will not have a positive future that that I, I just refuse to believe there's nothing that we can do because I'm seeing all the many things that we can do but then actually for my sanity I go outside and I whether it's literally just out my front door and I just listen because there are a lot of birds around or I can go for a walk or I just sit under a tree. I, I connect to nature in some way, and it might be just a small way, but that grounds me because nature continues to find ways. Uh, we have a last summer, a, a daisy that came up through concrete. Like, mm -hmm. just how did it do that? <laughs> but, and it was there for a long time and it found a way and it was so amazing. And you see that right on in mountains or wherever where something takes hold. And so for me, it's, it's trusting in nature or, or in, in our planet and the amazing things. And that brings my sanity back. Lovely. Thank nature you. Nature finds a way. So much, Harriet. It was lovely to sit down with the three of us this morning. Mm. And, and thank you for just writing a book that just feeds, feeds, your, feeds my soul gives me gives me lots to chew on and um and i'm buying multiple copies and sending them to every young <laughs> person who who is yeah every young person who has a, has a family coming along because i know they're all concerned about that uh, neither christine nor i have grandchildren it sounds like you probably don't yet either but for those those young parents um starting those conversations with with their kids the voices of our youth are so important yeah, I so agree. And thank you both too. It's been such a pleasure to be here and you both truly built my hope and it makes me just happy in, in a world of where it's very sad, a lot of the things that are happening, never mind the existential crisis of climate that we all work on and deal with. Just, it, I feel so much positivity from both of you. Um, so thank you. Thanks thank for having you. me on your show. That's this week's episode of Earth Feels. Special thanks to singer-songwriter Kristen Hoffman for generously allowing us to use song for the ocean. Thanks for listening. Don't forget, subscribe to our podcast so you don't miss an episode. Catch you next time. Bye-bye. Children of the earth, I'm calling out. There's a mission for you and for me.